moment. Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. We've been working our way through all of these really indictments that Paul makes against mankind, and it's not just one. It's not just the bad folks, so to speak. It's all of us. We're all dead in our trespasses and sins, like he says in Ephesians 2.1. We all walk based on the thought processes of the world. We all walk according to the power of Satan before we come to faith in Christ. We all are sins of disobedience. We all live in the lust of our flesh. We all carry out the desires of our flesh and of our mind. And then we come to this last statement, which is the most difficult statement by far. We all realize that before Christ, we are by nature, children of wrath. And so that is what I want us to look at this morning. And I cannot make it easier to swallow or digest for you. It's not a palatable phrase to think about at all. In fact, when you look at these seven phrases, five or seven, however you want to lay them out, really this phrase is more fearful than any other phrase. You might think, well, what about the first one, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins? Well, this one is worse because... Being by nature a child of wrath reminds us that even after we die, we cannot escape the rebellious lifestyle that we've led. That we have to stand before God and we have a debt to pay. There's judgment. And so we understand when we look at this phrase and and see that we were by nature children of wrath, we understand that our rebellion against God with our sinful ways will cost us apart from Christ. And so we have to deal with that. But it also prepares us for the next phrases that is going to come. Look in Ephesians 2, look at verse 5. At the end of that, it says, By grace you have been saved. Look at the end of verse 8, or rather verse 8, the beginning of it. For by grace you have been saved. So we go from, we were by nature children of wrath, which Paul is going to quickly remind us that by grace, however, we've been saved. And so what a joyous turn. In fact, the most significant turn in the whole Bible that you were by very nature of being a child of wrath, but God, by the grace of God, we have been saved if we know the Lord Jesus Christ. So hopefully we'll see this turn, we'll rejoice in this turn, but you look at all these phrases in 2, 1 through 4 that we've seen, or 1 through 3 rather that we've seen, It helps us to understand the glory of chapter 1, 3 through 14. When I talked about election and predestination and adoption and all those wonderful terms, your heart should leap and realize, had it not been for what God had done from beginning to end, I would not be a child of God. If God in His mercy and grace hadn't set things in motion like He did before the foundation of the world, I would never know Christ. I would never know grace. The only thing that I would be, it would be a a child of disobedience and be under the wrath of God for all of eternity. But praise God for what he's done. Now we come to this phrase, and this is the phrase that I want to look at this morning. Uh, You come to this part right here, and you know you'll withdraw a little bit. Uh, It's a little bit frightening to see that phrase, children of wrath. And by the way, that is one of the most argued about passages in Scripture. Is God trying to teach us what happens to children when they pass from this world before they have a chance to grow up? No, it's not what he's doing here at all, actually. I showed you this last week. He is moving from this thought in this phrase in a parallel fashion to this phrase. And when we saw this phrase, we understood about the fact that we were uh, familiar related. Uh, We were born in this fashion. We were sons of disobedience and we didn't think of children at all in that respect. We just saw the word disobedience. For some reason when you come down children of wrath you see child but you need to see wrath because it's a parallel statement. This is who we are in essence. 
we are sons of disobedience. We are children of wrath, right? The word is technon in the Bible. Technon is how we translate children or child. And it's used in two senses. Sometimes it's used in a very literal sense, actually meaning small versions of adults, okay? It's a literal child sense. But other times it's translated, it helps us think about offspring or descendants of, okay? Very different. If you have your Bible in Ephesians, look over at Ephesians chapter 5 and you'll see one time where he uses this word, not in a kid sense or a small child sense. Look at Ephesians 5 verse 1. Paul tells us here in God's word, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Technon, there's the word. Obviously he's not talking about you guys need to run around and act like a bunch of kids. That's not the picture. The picture is because you've been born again, you've been born of God, now emulate or model the character of your heavenly father. And we don't think about small children in that context at all. We understand what he's talking about because now that we've been born of the father, we act like the father. Look down in Ephesians 5.8, he does it again. Ephesians 5.8, Paul says, You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. He's not telling us here, technon of light. He's not telling us to act like a kid. He's telling us to act like we've been born of holiness. He's act, he's act, he's act like you've been descendants of God now because you have been saved by grace. So you can see when he uses this word in this sense or in this context, it means the offspring of or the descendants of. But look over in Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse 1. He'll use the same word in a different context, different meaning. Ephesians 6, 1, he says, children, obey your parents. Obviously, we know the context and the meaning of the word. He's talking to kids now. And he's talking to kids who are old enough to understand. And he tells them, through the power of the gospel, obey your parents. Kids, obey your parents. But it's the same word. Look at 6, 4. He does it again. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. We see what he's talking about, right? He's talking about kids in that sense. But when we go back to this passage in Ephesians 2, verse 3, we were by nature children of wrath. We see the parallel. We are sons of disobedience. Talking about we are descendants of sinners. We were born in this fashion. We were of the family of the rebellious kind. But nature, or rather children, is not the difficult word in, in, in this passage. Really, here's the most difficult word. It's the word nature. That's the one that we really can't get around at all. This word is phusis, P-H-U-S-I-S, -S, if you translate it into uh, English letters. Phusis, funny word. But it means, almost in every case, by nature or by what's normal or by what's natural for us. In some cases, it's translated by birth. By nature, it is what you are. Let me give you an example. I used to have a bird dog. Loved my bird dog. Cried when he died. His name was Molly. I don't know what it is in a bird dog. I don't know if they have a hatred toward birds. But they have this hunger and this passion to capture and bring every dead bird body to its master for some reason. It's just a burning desire. Their other dogs can be playing. Other dogs would be in a fight around us. Molly would be looking at a bird while I was bird hunting. That was her total focus in life. Now what I did was very foolish because I decided one day that I wanted chicken so we could eat fresh eggs. I didn't really put the two and two together. So I spent the rest of Molly's poor miserable life trying to teach her to leave my chickens alone. But chickens are birds. And so I forced her to live contrary to her nature most of her natural life. Probably made her a nervous wreck. But one day I come outside and she's sitting in the midst of a pile of feathers just eating a chicken. And I was livid. But there's nothing wrong with my bird dog because he did exactly what he was born to do. I killed a bird. And I'm enjoying myself despite what you think. By nature, that's who she was. And I couldn't change that dog's nature for anything. She was going to kill birds. And likewise, people buy dangerous animals right and then after so many years one of the animals winds up killing something or hurting someone and they go I don't understand they were so normal their whole lives they thought 
They were so fun and playful and easy to pet. I don't understand why they killed your dog, neighbor. Well, let me tell you why they did. It's who they are. They're just dangerous, some of them. They're not meant to be pets. That's who they naturally, normally are. They're by nature dangerous animals. Why people have pet snakes, I'll never know. It's crazy. I had a friend of mine in Auburn in pharmacy school. He brought his pet python to pharmacy school. I'm like, that's weird, man. It's not normal. By nature, the thing kills and eats. And you're the only thing in your apartment. It's not going to work out. That we can understand. But when I tell you as human beings, we're born with a nature that is rebellious toward God. Really? Yeah, really. And you know as well as I do, if you've ever been around kids or grandkids, children are born with a very natural and normal rebellious behavior. Before they can talk, before they can walk, they have already gained some sense of what pleases mom or dad or what doesn't please mom or dad. And, and they will willingly walk in disobedience before they can ever express themselves with words. And they'll look at you and do it anyway to see what you're going to do. That's just natural. We're rebels by nature. In fact, when you look at this word phusis, it's used translated, trying to grasp the meaning of it. And, and for instance, in Romans 2.14, look how the word phusis is translated. When Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively. That's one way to translate by nature, children of wrath. Instinctively, that's who you are. Here's another one, Galatians 2.15. We are Jews by nature, which is this word, but the, the ESV just goes ahead and translates it by birth. Talking about ethnicity. You're a Jew because you were had Jewish parents, so you were Jew by birth. It's the same word, phusis. And so when I tell you by nature you're a child of wrath, you need to understand by the fact that you had a human being for a mom and a dad, you need to know that you were by nature a rebellious sinner. This will help you understand why Jesus had to be born a virgin. He had to be born of the Spirit of God. Because every individual that's ever been born of one man and one woman is a rebel, is a sinner, is under the wrath of God, according to the word of God. So then by nature, human beings are children of wrath. It's our essence. It's who we are. We did not become fallen because we sinned. We sinned because we were fallen when we were born. We were born in a fallen state. And all of this comes from Adam, our father. Adam, when he rebelled against God in the garden, plunged all of us, not with the possibility of sinning, not with the probability of sinning, but with the certainty of being sinful. Just as it was natural for you to be born with skin wrapped around your body, you were born with a rebellious, sinful nature. Look at what the Bible says. I don't make this up. For then as through one transgression, in reference to Adam, there resulted in condemnation to most men, some men, all men. Not the possibility of condemnation, but the absolute certainty of condemnation because of what Adam has done. We are by nature sinners. Look at uh, the next verse in Romans 5, 19. For through one man's disobedience, the men were, or the many were, what? Probably going to be sinners. The many were likely going to be sinners. What does the text say? The many were made sinners. So Romans 5, it's, you, you really can't argue with it. It's just the way things are. You never have to look at this sweet, innocent child in your arms and go, I wonder if it'll be rebellious and sinful. Yes. Let me answer that for you. In fact, rebellion is already welling up in their souls. It is who they are. It's very humbling to think about that. Uh, very disappointing, in fact, right? Especially when we got little girls that are born boys. I can see rebellion Saw it on John's face when he was born. Girls, right, Jonathan? No, nah, no, not possible. Oh, yeah. Sandra, will you say amen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she had three. <laughs> 
It's who we are as human beings. And David understood this when he's confessing sin about his sin with Bathsheba in Psalms 51. Look what he said. I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. He's not saying mom sinned when I was conceived. He's saying at the moment of my conception, a sinner was brought to life. That's hard to swallow. At the moment of my conception, sin was born. And when I was brought forth from my mother's womb, I was brought forth in iniquity. So just as by nature we are born human, by nature we are born sinful, and therefore by nature we are sons of disobedience, and by nature we are the children of wrath. And you think about the Old Testament record is just a record of the sinfulness of man. God rescues them from Egypt with just remarkable ten plagues, just unbelievable, unimaginable plagues, carries them out in the desert, cross the sea on dry land, gets them to the other side, appears to them on the mountain, and just because of their impatience, when Moses is gone for a short period of time, what do they do? Take off their jewelry and they fashion a golden calf and they bow down and worship. Dude. And you're like, how is that possible? No, you're asking the wrong question. That, how is that not possible? They're going to do that. You should have seen it coming. In fact, if God were to withdraw from us for a short period of time, apart from the grace of God, staying us and keeping us, we would be easily wrapped up in rebellion. And you think about this when you send your... Cha- all these people got young kids around here. One day you're going to send all these precious sweet little kids off to college. And depending on how you've taught them, not with the law, but with the grace, depending on how you've raised them, don't be surprised when they fall into sin. In fact, even if you've done everything in communicating the truth of the gospel and the grace in the gospel, don't be surprised if they fall into sin. Don't be one of those, I can't believe they did that. Why? What were you expecting? They're sinners. And especially if you raise them in the law, always law, always do this, do this, do this, do this. Always boxing them in with the law. Every time you box them in with the law as a parent, one day they're going to be free from the law. And you know what they're going to do the moment they're free from the law? They're going to burst forth in sin. It's who we are as human beings. By nature... Sinful, by nature, rebellious, by nature, we want to be God's. And so God's word says, by nature, we're dead in sins. By nature, we're destined for hell. And by nature, we deserve the eternal wrath of God. Just by nature. Now do you understand Jesus' words in John 3? You must be born again because you desperately need a different nature. You see, the only way possible for you to get away from your corrupt, fallen nature is to be given a new nature by grace. And that's why Nicodemus looked at Jesus in absolute awe. What are you talking about? He knew exactly what he was talking about. You've got to be made new. You've got to be born again. You've got to receive the nature of God because the nature that you have now can never please God. But nature is not the worst word. Let me go back. Here is the worst word in all of this. Can you see purple? That's the worst word. That's the word wrath. That's the word that should draw all of our attention. That is the most frightening word. This is the word we're most concerned about this morning. And oddly enough, wrath is not something the church likes to talk about anymore. It's very funny. It's not funny, actually. It's sad. You read sermons from the 1600s, 1700s, early 1800s. You'll see sermons and messages about the wrath of God. But you get into the mid-1800s, things start to change. Then you get into the 1900s. And then, obviously, more recently, you hear about the love of God. And you're like, isn't He loving? Well, absolutely. But just like the calf, they, they... They formed the God that they were most comfortable with. They created a God that would take them back home where they wanted to go. They were ignoring that God who is was taking them away. And we see one side of God and you go, well, I like the God of love. Well, he's also the God of wrath. 
Don't love the side that you want to love. Understand, there's more to this God. And part of his attributes is his wrath. Back in the 1700s, one of the most significant sermons that was preached was entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, July 8, 1741. Here's part of that sermon. Jonathan Edwards says, The bow of God's wrath is bent, and the arrow made ready on the string, and justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow. It is nothing but the mere pleasure of God, that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being drunk with your blood. Can you imagine somebody preaching that these days at a revival? That's hardcore stuff. You read that whole sermon, you just leave there trembling. Now we hear uh, evangelistic rally or revival service. The pastor wants to be cute and he wants to connect and he wants to be charismatic and he wants to gain your attention. So he wants to talk about things that will make you laugh and things that will make you smile and somehow wind that up with the gospel. You can't because the gospel starts with wrath. And Jonathan Edwards didn't just make this stuff up out of his heart. I think he probably had Psalm 7 in his heart when he wrote these words. Look at Psalm 7, verse 11 through 13. God is a righteous judge, a God who has wrath or indignation every day. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow. He has made it ready. He also has prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. That's in the Bible. The Bible actually says that God is filled with hatred every day. He is filled with wrath and indignation every day. And he has a bow drawn, as the psalmist puts it. It's bent back and it's straining and he has an arrow in his bow and he's lit the tip with fire and he has it pointed toward the hearts of all unrepentant men. When's the last time you heard about that side of our God? He's full of wrath. I can't imagine being a part of a service like that. And I can't imagine actually hearing one of those today. I love to listen to Martin Lloyd-Jones. He's an Englishman that preached in the 40s. And he has this tone about him. He says, the wrath of God. And you just like tremble listening to it. It's awesome. And I'm like, I wish I could talk like that. But to say things like that, just his voice carries over the conversation. You can just hear a pin drop. God's talking about wrath. We never talk about wrath. But like I said this morning, or just a moment ago rather, wrath is the very starting point of the gospel. If you have your Bible, go back to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. Keep your finger, we'll be right back to Ephesians in just a second. Romans chapter 1. I mean, here's the thought. Today's gospel is, I've got better news for you. You're living your life how you want to live and you're doing the things that you want to do and you're having your, all your fun and God wants to make it even better. He wants to give you a super blessed life and when you die, He's just going to take you on to heaven where it's the best place you could ever possibly be. That's today's gospel. But the gospel that you find in the Bible starts with horrible, bad news. Because what good is good news if you don't have really bad news? What good is it for a doctor to walk into a room and say, I have one medicine that can cure you. What good is that unless he's told you first, you have terminal cancer and you're probably going to die. And you go, that's horrible news. I know, but I've got some good news. And you're like, what could possibly be good? I'm going to die. He's like, well, I've got one thing that I'm going to give you. And I got 100% cure rate with it. And you're going, oh wait, that's good news. That's really good news. Let me have that. And today when we preach the gospel, we don't give them the bad news. We don't tell them that God's got a drawn bow with an arrow pointed at their chest and he's lit the tip and he's just quivering to let it go in his anger over their sinfulness. No, we say God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Or we tell them some joke. But that's not the picture in the Bible. Look at Romans chapter 1, look at verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So the wrath of God is ready to be revealed against all men 
who choose sin over the righteousness of Christ. Look at Romans chapter 2, look at verse 5. Because of your stubbornness, I wonder how this would preach today. Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Storing up wrath. When I was a senior, when I graduated high school, dad carried me out west and went to the Hoover Dam. I don't know if you've ever been there or seen it, but it is absolutely fearful and awesome at the same time. They've got the whole Colorado River dammed up with one dam, the Hoover Dam. And you stand on the edge of that thing and you look to the bottom of it and you're like, dude, this is massive. I mean, they've walled off an entire canyon with concrete. And to see the bottom of it, it's so tiny down there because the thing is so high. And there's just a little bitty stream running out of the bottom of it. And you turn around the, uh, the Hoover Dam and you look the other way and you see the Colorado River and it's a canyon full of water backed up for miles. And it's as deep as the other side of that dam is long. And you're thinking, this is really a bad idea. Who thought this was a good idea? In one moment, a hairline crack could come up from that concrete and you talk about a horrible torrent ripping through a canyon. Dude, it would tear up and destroy everything in its path. And this is the picture of the wrath of God. God's like, I've got it dammed up. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart toward me, this dam's going to break because I'm going to split it right down the middle. And all of this wrath that I keep backing up is going to sweep forward and it's going to destroy you and everything in its path. That's the gospel. That's the reason I can tell you that I've got good news about Christ. Because the bad news is, God's so angry with you, He's just wrath, it's just pent up behind Him. And He's just waiting for that moment when He's decided, I'm going to let this thing go. And the wrath of God will sweep through mankind and destroy every sinner for all eternity. And He will only spare one group of people, the group that is in Christ. Go back to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 is more of a gospel for us who have walked an aisle or prayed a prayer, or done something silly in that nature. And we know in our hearts we don't really care about Christ. In fact, we're just trying to steal eternal life from His hand. We're fully committed to living our own lives. And we think we've suckered Him into signing some sort of contract to let us go into heaven when we die. Ephesians 5 will speak to you. Look at verses 1 through 6. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Listen, but immorality, any kind, or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you so as proper among the saints. There must be no filthiness, silly talk, coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no, listen, for this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Don't be a fool. If you like playing around with immorality and impurity and all these sorts of things, don't be a fool. I don't care what you've done. If you've not been born again, if you don't have a new nature, if you don't learn to, like Cody was talking about, walk in denying of ourselves and our sins and pursue holiness, don't let anybody fool you with empty words, clouds without rain. Because with absolute certainty, the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Be certain of that. Wrath is a part, like we said, of the character of God. Here's a thought for you this morning. How would you describe a lion to your child? Think about this. You'd say, oh, his mane is just absolutely majestic. His coat going down his back is just sheer golden. It's so beautiful. His muscles are massive. His eyes are piercing. His paws, they're huge. It's the most glorious, beautiful beast that God has ever created. It's an awesome sight to actually stand in the presence of a lion. 
And the son would go, well, let me pet it. And you go, oh, no, you don't know the full story. This animal can kill at will. There's not an animal on the planet that's not afraid of a lion. His roar will just rip through the air, frightening everyone. Don't ever go near a lion. He could strike you with his paw and you would be dead. He could bite you in half. You better fear the lion. But be careful to notice his glorious beauty and awesomeness. We would describe a lion that way to our child. But would you describe God that way? No, when we describe God to our children, we want to talk about love. Oh, he's loving. He's he's forgiving. We, We paint him out to be like a grandpa. Man, he just wants to get you up in his lap and tossle your hair, get you some toys. He's got candy in both pockets. He just wants to lead you through life and bless you from... Well, yes, part of that, not all of that, part of that is true. He is loving. But have you ever told your children how this God is also full of wrath and is to be feared? You know, by doing that, you're building the, or you're placing the building blocks of the gospel in their hearts. Yes, he is a God of intense love. He can love like no one else. But you also need to know, child, that he is a God that is to be feared. Because he is filled with wrath for those who reject him and despise him and refuse to walk in disobedience to him. If we describe a lion in a correct way, why in the world would we describe God in a correct way? Even to our kids. I wonder how you'd respond if Wes got a hold of this and he preached a whole lesson to our kids on the wrath of God and they all came home absolutely fearful. Would you be mad? Would you be calling me? I heard you say, thanks, Wes, for getting this ball started. i got to get into them of this. Because I need to tell my kids about the wrath of God. You cannot understand the love of God if you do not understand the hate of God. God is perfect in love, just like He is perfect in hate. Look at this passage in Hebrews 1.9. Did you know this was in your Bible? It says of God, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. It says that about God. God hates sin every day. He has a passionate hatred for sin. Obviously. Right? He let his son die for one reason and one reason alone. Sin. Of course he hates sin. How could he not hate sin? He poured out his wrath on his son. And here's why. Because God made him who knew no sin to be sin. So God took our sins and placed it on his son and then extinguished his wrath on the son so that you and I could stand in the glory of the gospel and realize Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No condemnation for us who know Jesus. We will never know wrath. Amen? Amen. You will never see that side of this loving God. But if you continue to sit in rebellion and sin, that is all you will know. You will never know the love of God. You will never know the mercy of God because you have chosen sin and rebellion to be in your way. God will pour out wrath on his sin because he's already poured out wrath on his sin at Calvary. And he will pour out his wrath again for those who do not hide under the shadow and the shelter of the cross. Wrath comes. Someone has said this, the most glorious thing about heaven is God. And certainly in heaven we'll know the full experience of his love. But they have also said this, the most terrifying thing about hell is God. Because in hell you will know the fullness of his wrath. Unhindered in every way. Hebrews 12 tells us this, that our God is a consuming fire. I won't take our time this morning to go through them. I wonder how long it's been since we've picked up a hymnal and sang a song about the wrath of God. We don't because I don't know of one single song in our hymnal about the wrath of God. In fact, you'd have to go back a couple of hundred years to find a Baptist hymnal that had songs in it about the wrath of God. But the songbook in your Bible, the book of Psalms, has several songs about the wrath of God. 
Psalms 2, I may have put these in your, in, your, in your book this morning or in your sermon guide. Psalms 2, Psalm 78, Psalms 90. Go through those and read those psalms. They're absolutely terrifying, some of them. That God in His vengeance, one, He describes people as fuel for His flame in the day of wrath and judgment. There is one song that we sing with some regularity about in Christ alone. Do you remember the second stanza? In Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, what? The wrath of God was satisfied. You know, there were some denominations that refused to put that song in their hymn book because of that one verse. And they contacted the guy who wrote that song, Getty, and said, will you take this verse out or would you change it? And they even offered him an alternative. And he says, no, what I've written, I've written. And so they just left out in Christ alone out of their hymnal because they refused to sing about the wrath of God being poured out on the Son. But if it had not been for the wrath of God poured out on the Son, you and I would not have a way to be right with God because wrath still is due. There's wrath all over the Old Testament. He says in Jeremiah 7, God says, Behold, my anger and my wrath will be poured out in this place and on man and on beast and on trees and on field and on fruit of the ground. It will burn and it will not be quenched. There's wrath in the New Testament. Remember what John said when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came forth to be baptized? He said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Flee. That was his word of instruction. Run. Because God's wrath will come. And then in John, in his gospel, he says, he who has believed in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You think about God's wrath, though. It, it should bring us a lot of comfort. And let me explain. Just if you bear with me just a few more minutes. The wrath of God should actually bring us comfort. And here's why. When you think about our wrath, our wrath is very unpredictable. We blow a fuse. We fly off the handle. We lose control when you might least expect, when you might least expect it. Hopefully you didn't have a dad like that. And if I ever figured out that there was a dad in this congregation like that, I will be at your house. What a horrifying thing as a child to grow up in a dad whose wrath is just unpredictable and uncontrollable at any given moment. It might blow and it not just blow at the one thing that's made him angry. Everybody in the house will get swept up in his wrath. That's a horrifying way for a child to live. But you know, that's human wrath. God's wrath is not unpredictable. He does not pop off or fly off at the handle. His wrath is very predictable. And it's very specific in who it's directed towards. And no one else experiences it. It's specifically and predictably spent on sinners. And for those who are apart from Christ. He does not respond in wrath one day and he's submissive the next. It is his constant response to evil. He always reacts to evil in the same unchanging, predictable, uncompromising way. It is the divine response. It comes with consistency and again predictability and therefore we can rest in wrath. You know. You know that the wrath of God comes. And you know for whom it comes. And you know for whom it does not. And when you know something, you can rest in it. I know, as believers and followers of Christ in this room, you'll never see it. There is no wrath for you. It has been utterly extinguished in the cross. But for some of those of you who may be deceiving the rest of us or this morning, don't know Christ, now it is very specifically for you. And you will get the fullness of it. And it will come in the day of wrath. That is the only thing I don't know. But what I do know is it will come. It will be for you who are unrepentant. And you will never escape it. And it will consume you for all eternity. Last thought is, 
The wrath of God in the Bible is often depicted as a cup. And we talked about this when we went through the book of Hebrews. It's a wonderful picture in Jeremiah 25. He says, God says to his prophet, Take this cup of the wine of the wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. They will drink and stagger and they'll go mad because of the sword that I'll send among them. And then you hear about the cup of wrath again in Revelations chapter 14. He says, He also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of His anger, and He will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of His holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. You got a cup of wrath in the Old Testament. You got a cup of wrath in the New Testament. And then we hear the words of our Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? What does He say? Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. He's not afraid to be crucified. He's not afraid to be beaten to death. Goodness gracious, just a few years later, Christians would go to their death rejoicing and singing that God had counted them worthy to be crucified. He's not afraid of physical pain. His fear is the wrath of the Father that's about to be poured out upon him, who is an innocent man, has yet nonetheless agreed of his own free will to take upon the sin of mankind and to stand in their place and receive the dam breaking as the wrath of God sweeps over his body. And in that he was very afraid. God himself was afraid. And you sit there in unrepentance. What is wrong with you? Do you not know the horrifying terror of the wrath of God? The Son of God, it said, praying fervently, began to sweat like drops of blood. And if I could adequately communicate to you the wrath of God, and you sit here this morning in unrepentance and rebellion against God, you too would sweat drops of blood if you could understand. It's a horrifying thing. But yet there's a beautiful thing. There's an absolute beautiful thing for us this morning. Look at, I had to limit them to two just for the sake of time. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2. He's instructing us to wait for His Son from heaven, the second return of Christ, whom God has raised from the dead. That is Jesus. Look. Who rescues us from the wrath to come. Look at Romans 5. Much more than having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. God is full of wrath every day. But in His mercy and His grace, He has extended us a time and a safe place to run. The dam will break and the wrath will flood the entire existence of humanity. But there is one place of shelter that has been provided for all. And there's room for all. And that place is at the foot of the cross. If you find yourself in the shade of the cross this morning, your heart should lift with joy and thanksgiving because you will never experience the wrath of God. But if you do not stand in the shade of the cross... I encourage you to be gripped mortally with fear because the wrath of God comes upon sinners. Let's pray.